Any views or opinions expressed in this podcast are strictly the views or opinions of the presenter. Nothing in here is the view of the firms, corporations, financial entities that anybody represents. Uh, Nothing expressed here is a view of any um, regulator or semi-regulatory agency. Uh, All content is intended to be educational. Nothing in this episode construes specific investment advice. And if you do require advice, you should seek an appropriate advisor, be that a financial planner or a tax advisor or possibly a lawyer. And I think BBD does a lot of that. Well, (laughs) I think BBD does a lot of that kind of thing, though. I think there's a lot of um, sort of conscious thinking about how to name things and how to how to approach a relationship oh, so that's, it, that's if that was the case they would not have come up with as only <laughs> <laughs> which is aso I, I, yeah sorry just call us out call us out and welcome back to the ce drive podcast this is jason watt and i should say welcome to the ce drive podcast and the cgib navigator podcast so this is our first in a series that uh, dave patriarch from canadian group insurance brokers and mainstay insurance will be doing together um, about once a quarter we're going to release an episode that will co-brand um, under the cgib navigator and ce drive brands and it's going to offer um, CE credits at both places. You'll just have to be a business career college subscriber to get those credits. Uh, So today's episode and all the episodes obviously will have a group benefits tilt to them. Uh, Today's episode will be good for uh, life insurance credit in British Columbia, an accident and sickness credit in Alberta, uh, credit in Saskatchewan, Manitoba and Ontario, an advocates credit, FP Canada financial planning credit, Uh, No IROC or MFDA credits for this one. Uh, We're just going to get it approved for the insurance and financial planning categories. Okay, the uh, object today is a French press. My French press right here. Uh, So I'm at the lake, as you can see. And when I'm here, one of my treats to myself is that in the morning, I boil up a pot of water and make myself a couple of cups of coffee in my um, French press. So that is our object for today. Okay, the subject of our interview today, it's going to be me and Dave, or Dave and I, I suppose, sorry, interviewing uh, Jordan Bolhos. Jordan is with Benefits by Design. Uh, Some of you remember Mike McClenahan was on in season three, talking about the role of third-party administrators. Uh, This is a follow-on as well to the last time I had Dave Patriarch on the podcast. Dave talked about the catastrophic uh, health insurance program that's run through BBD and uh, CGIB. Um, And Here, we have the one-year renewal date, the sort of anniversary for this program, and this little victory lap, actually. The uh, renewal you'll find in the show notes. There's lots of stuff in the show notes. You can go and click through those links. There's tons of interesting stuff in today's uh, show notes. Um, But anyways, um, yeah, really a year of putting this risk on the the table, uh, selling this uh, catastrophic plan. And I think that it's renewed um, as or maybe better than expected. So nice to see. Um, And it really does put some uh, credence to the idea that when you get advisors who um, understand their clients well and are placing risk that matches how the clients need that risk insured, that it makes a big difference. So let's roll into the interview with Jordan. Hi, I'm here today with uh, Dave Patriarch and uh, Jordan Ballhost. Uh, Dave, of course, is well known to listeners of the podcast, although we're doing something a little bit different today. So Dave is, of course, the founder of Canadian Group Insurance Brokers and Mainstay Insurance. And this will be the first episode of a co-release uh, branded under CE Drive with Business Career College and branded under the CGIB Navigator brand, because uh, Dave and I have noticed that uh, there's not anybody producing sort of lots of good regular group benefits focused podcast today. So Dave and I figured we're gonna tackle that. And uh, Jordan, of course, with uh, Benefits by Design. Is it actually Benefits by Design? Is it BBD? I don't know what happens there, Jordan. It, it is whatever you want it to be. That's that's <laughs> it. That's the name of the game right there. <laughs> I, ha- I have the socks, I have the BBD socks. So, although I'm not wearing them today, it's a little bit, a little bit much for socks today. So Jordan, can you give us a little rundown about uh, who you are and what you do at Benefits by Design? Absolutely. Yeah. So I am a business development specialist here at Benefits by Design. 
So uh, the long and short of that is basically supporting our sales team um, with making sure, you know, they're up to speed on our, you know, most recent product offerings, but also helping them uh, identify, you know, new business opportunities, opportunities to promote certain solutions and products, um, as well as, um, you know, like we've done here with CGIB Chip, kind of designing new innovative products for the group market. Um, so it's a little, a little bit of everything all encompassing, which is really fun. So um, that's my role here at BBD. And outside of BBD, I'm an avid, avid musician, as most folks may know. Uh, I play in a couple of groups around town on, on the drums. And uh, I do a lot of uh, my own music, too, so on, on a solo basis. So I'm very, very much a music nerd and benefits nerd, respectively. So Perfect. Yeah. Um, yeah, the uh, music, actually, as you say that, now I remember a day posting some YouTube stuff up with you on it on the CGIB <laughs> channel. So you got to get people's personalities into this stuff. It's what separates us and makes us stand out. That's I'm, it. Uh, yeah. I actually posted an article about that very thing on the CGIB Slack channel this morning, Dave, about, uh, and about letting I actually your... commented on it because I thought it was so great, actually. So right, perfect timing. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Megan, yeah. Megan Lurt's article on kitsis.com for those who are out there about uh, sort of, being your your whole self when you're dealing with people so yeah good yeah, job don't good don't hide your personality make it part of you of your business yeah. you yeah that's right like you could be a sailor who sells benefits for example dave right for example yeah i don't yeah, hide just... that one very well <laughs> no you don't <laughs> um so can you describe an ideal client for us jordan is there such yeah, a thing absolutely there definitely is such a thing so i would say a bbd our ideal client is the advisor and when I say the advisor, I mean someone that is specializing in employee benefits, someone that really understands, you know, the inner workings, the day-to-day -day of the ongoing administration of a benefits plan. You know, they know how to position a renewal. They know how to sell value over price. Um, I would say that's really kind of our ideal client here at BBD. Fantastic. Dave? And so what just what do you uh, tell me a little bit about what you do with them, how you support them, how you bring that back into your role and stuff like that? Absolutely. Yeah. So um, I guess specifically with my role as a business development specialist, uh, we do a lot around uh, lead generation, whether it's through our website lead generation process or if it's, you know, uh, reach out. Um, qualifying, qualifying opportunities and handing them off to our, our benefit specialist partners to allow them to kind of show their value and do their work. So um, we really like to give back to, to our advisors and make sure that they have opportunities to sell as well. Um, and we really believe in the philosophy of the advisor too, the, the value they can provide in a, in a business partnership, uh, both from a, an education standpoint and an ongoing you know, maintenance standpoint as well. And I'd love to throw how uh, I kind of first met Jordan out there. He can maybe give his two cents worth, but uh, oh, back, goodness. <laughs> yeah, we, we did a CGIB uh, workshop in August, 2018. And um, for, for some reason um, they decided Jordan had to be the one to get up on stage and speak. And you'd been at BBD for less than a year, I think still kind of finding your way around. And all of a sudden you're in front of all these advisors who are harsh critics and you did uh, very well. So that, that was my, my first, um, first time kind of really meeting you in person and watching you do your thing. Yeah, that was, that was quite a moment. I'll, I'll never forget that. Um, it was basically like, uh, it was an email that, that went out to the, to our PD team, our partnership development team. And uh, it was from one of my, my, one of my colleagues and it said, uh, you know, BBD is sponsoring this upcoming CGIB event in August, and uh, who who wants to do the speech? And uh, no one no one had chimed in, so <laughs> I was like, okay, you know what? I'm just gonna throw it all out there. I'm gonna put it on the line. Why not? Let's give it a shot, right? So I put this whole you know speech together, and I brought I I didn't know that intros were typically done, you know, with powerpoints and a slide and everything. So I was really just so green. <laughs> but uh, I put this whole, you know, little speech together. I brought my little pieces of paper up to the front of the room and I held the mic and I was reading through my, from my papers and, you know, I was, sh I was shaking like this in the one hand. And oh, yeah. It was, yeah, it was <laughs> it was pretty, pretty brutal. But uh, hey, it's no. trial by fire. That that doesn't kill that's, you makes you stronger. That's and how you learn. Yeah, you're still there. So, I mean, it all worked out for the best. Absolutely. Yeah, that was a that was a great cgib introduction if i do say so myself <laughs> yeah so 
Now, what about your relationship with uh, Canadian group insurance brokers, Jordan? I, I think this ties into this a little bit, but uh, yeah. you know, I see you're active in that community. We already talked about you know, posting your personal uh, music videos on there. What does that look like with CGIB? Yeah, so I think I, I really value my relationship with CGIB, and not only because you know I'm the, I'm the CGIB chip rep or anything like that, but I really believe in you know, it's, it's awesome to see the advisors from the country come together and help each other out. Um, and as someone that's, you know, new, newish to the group industry, I mean, I don't have as many years of experience as most of the advisors in the group do. It's really valuable to learn from that, from that group of advisors. And, you know, I feel like having that industry knowledge and insight, even on, on the rep side, like as a, as a, so to speak, rep, not necessarily an advisor, but as a rep, I really think helps sets me apart as well from, you know, the other players in the market. So, um, yeah, I just I, I find tremendous value in, in CGIB and just the insights that can be learned on a daily basis. It's just yeah, it's unreal. I, I think Jordan's been a member since just after that first event. So for, for yeah. a few years. And, and like you said, now, to be fair, Jordan doesn't post his music videos. I do no, it. To, you do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I love to show off our members when they, when they do neat stuff and everything. So, yeah. Yeah. And Dave, I'm wondering if you can just chime in for a second here, because yeah. I think we're lucky in CJB to see some folks like Jordan, some folks from some of the, you know, TPAs or other providers uh, yep. as active participants. You know, I think about like Steve McEwen and Andrew Bransma, for example. Um, yeah. You know, and, and we you, have it from, go actively uh, cultivate those. Sorry, go no, ahead. they chase us down. Like it's it's interesting. So the group was made to be an advisor supporting advisor network, but very quickly, and I'm going back like over 15 years ago, we found we'd have a bunch of advisors that would all sit down together and say, "Well, this is the way it is," and somebody else would say, "No, this is the way that it is." Like, no, no. So we'd say, "Okay, well, let's bring the insurance company or the TPA or provider in, and have a." Uh, conversation to find out what the right way is or what the way they're really doing it. So over the years, we've had um, insurance companies involved a little bit less so now, um, uh, but more TPAs now than ever before and PBMs and EAP suppliers and all sorts of other players in the marketplace. And like you said, they're active. Um, it's not a place to solicit your business before, you know, hundred people try and join just to promote, but, um, but definitely they add a lot of value to the conversation and, answering questions and helping us to understand what the other side is like sometimes. And, and that's, that's really important to everybody's education. I think. I think with the folks that we've mentioned here, I don't think I've ever seen them use their own company names in uh, even in, in answering no. a post, I think they're pretty careful about it. So yeah. yeah year, years ago, we had a few people that kind of pushed it a little bit too far and, and we had members complain and they were shut down pretty quickly um, because it just was, you know, every post was, here's why we're the best solution. And, and pretty quickly advisors go, you know what, you're, you may be the best solution today, but not tomorrow. And somebody has got this and you've got that. There is no one perfect answer. And, yeah. and, um, and I think most of the people are very respectful of the audience who's listening and, and all just are helpful, educational without being salesy and advertorial. Yeah. And, and at the end of the day, advisors know where to go, right? Like if they, if they know they need a unique solution or they need a certain product or whatever it is, they know where they need to go, right? Like people don't need to always be putting it front and forward, right? I think it's the respectful thing to do is just participate, give value, add, add value, you know, give your two cents and the rest will follow kind of thing. That's perfect. Um, I also noted uh, partnership development, PD. I like that uh, yeah. lingo. I've not heard that before. So <laughs> as a, like, it's not BD normally, right? So yeah, that's, yeah. that's a, uh, and I think BBD does a lot of that. Well, <laughs> I think BBD does a lot of that kind of thing, though. I think there's a lot of um, sort of conscious thinking about how to name things and how to how to approach a relationship. Oh, so that's, it, that's a if good that example. was the case, they would not have come up with as only, <laughs> which is ASO. I, I, yeah, sorry, just call us out. Call us out. <laughs> that's the only one. Ben account was fine. Ben pack was okay. You know, yeah, that, that one I always kind of had a problem with. But yeah, okay, that's sorry. Fair. All right. Um, so now, what about uh, some of your biggest challenges? You know, we talk about BBD in particular here, but what are your biggest challenges in keeping your groups 
or advisors happy? And do you see it as the same thing? Like, is it keep the advisor happy, keep the group happy? Or do you see that there's a little bit of uh, friction or a disconnect sometimes there, Jordan? Yeah, I think I think they, they probably go hand in hand. Uh, like Dave and I were talking a little bit earlier about, you know, the rate battle. And there's going to be advisors out there that that understand how to sell the renewal and they know, you know, to look at the claims, wh what's driving the claims experience. Is this the right renewal to be to be going out and there are a lot of advisors that yeah like they understand it and they're able to sell it um but there are a, a good bulk that you know it's always the rate battle it's can we get this lower can we get this to a you know can we get this plus 20 to a plus 10 or um and so i think as a as a um as a result you know that's trying to keep the advisor happy and the group happy right that's why i mean they go hand in hand the advisor is going to so to speak, going to, to going to bat for the client, right? So um, I would say that's probably the biggest challenge uh, is just you know making sure that that pricing we're putting forward is is making sense at time of renewal. It's uh, you know it's interesting. It it seems to always come back to rates. Um, Dave, any comments? Yeah. Like, should it be uh, just rates? What do you figure here? It, it shouldn't be. Like, I mean, it should be fair pricing. I mean we don't see this in anything else. I mean, the U S in the small market up to hundred lives is fully pooled. There is no negotiation. This is your rate. That's it. It's reasonable. Um, and they're insured. We, we have made this much more complicated than we need to. And this whole negotiation of even like a three life group, um, trying to negotiate a renewal is an absolute waste of time. So, um, I, I think it's an area that, uh, one advisors have got to get better at selling a fair renewal and i'm, I'm not saying that it, people are going to like it if you have a catastrophic claim and high high cost and your rates are going up 30 percent um and it's fair then sell the 30 percent increase or make a plan design change or or you know do something to or you know like an, an uh an exclusionary formulary maybe or a drug cap or or switch to a hybrid plan or something um trying to kind of beat blood out of a stone is is ridiculous and insurance companies we don't want them to lose on every case otherwise they wouldn't be here at insurance companies tpas you know everybody so yeah. um it is it is a big challenge and i think it's insurers have got to get smarter about preparing renewals and information they share and and pooling but I think advisors definitely have to get better at, at selling what's a what's a fair renewal. Yeah, that's yeah, it's a great point, and I think there's a lot of positioning that can be done around that fair renewal. And I, you know, some of that is, and I know you do this, Dave, and I'm sure I know Jordan, you encourage this, and that's sort of staying on top of your your um, claims in advance of renewal season. Right. That's uh... yeah. And I'm, if you can like do mid-year reports, and it, obviously it depends on the size of the group. If it's a thousand life group, it's going to be a different reporting than a, a three life group. But um, if you can kind of give people a heads up of what's coming up, what's going on, pre-prepare for a renewal, there should be no huge surprises. I mean, there still can be, but there shouldn't be. And uh, I think that, you know, using proper plan design and good communication and being proactive rather than reactive is good. I, I think the worst thing you can do is walk into a renewal with a terrible, uh, you know, rate increase, and it's a surprise to the client. Yeah, I don't think it should be. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think even just it. walking into the walking into the renewal is like just one step. Some some folks will just send the renewal and that that's it. Like I've heard yeah. I've heard stories of that too. So the fact yeah. you're even walking in is a good first step. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I always think about uh, Tim Kane with the uh, steak sandwich renewal on that one. I don't know if you've heard Tim from the, he's one of the founders sandwich. of, yeah, so yeah. he likes to talk about how he thought when he first came into the benefits industry, he came from the, the property and casualty side, and he'd sort of picked up the business and, you know, was doing renewals where he just, he, he was taught this, right? I think I might get this a little bit wrong here, but essentially taught by the guy he bought his block from that you know you show up for your renewal you book a like a lunch meeting with a client here's the renewal buy a steak sandwich for the client and presto move on to the next one and so simple so easy <laughs> yeah <laughs> and sort of like this is a ridiculous business like really if that's all it is now anybody who's actually dealt with difficult renewals or whatever knows that it's more than that but you know tim uh, tim sort of said like if if this is the whole business then why isn't everybody here kind of thing so yeah. yeah. And there aren't a lot of group specialists 
um, in Canada are benefit specialists. I mean, it's kind of down to a handful of people. Um, should we kind of move on to? Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. The, yeah, I don't know. I just try to keep us Good moving discussion. along. Yeah, it's keep, great. Yeah. Um, so, what do you see, um, Jordan, as um, what we see in the large market? that we'd like to see in the small market. I know BBD kind of works in the small to mid-sized market more so. So maybe it's kind of just envy of what the other guys have, but what do you see there as being uh, um, something that we could use more of? Yeah, honestly, I product solution wise, can't think of anything specifically, but honestly, what the large market has that the small group market doesn't have is spread of risk, right? The, a larger a larger group to offset the cost of claims. Um, the more dollars you have coming in, the better of a position you're going to be in to to help handle you know high claims on a plan. And I really think that's what a large group that's the best thing a large group has going for it. And so when you when you kind of think of that, you know, larger larger group, bigger spread of risk, to offset of claims. That's really what we're doing with the CGIB chip plan here. We're fully pooling all the small groups together to kind of, you know, give it that large group feel. We're spreading the risk. There's a bigger spread of risk there. So, you know, when you, when you have that three life group or that four life group, that's seeing a catastrophic claim, their rates aren't going to skyrocket. They're going to be pretty stable year to year because we have that, that large spread of risk on our side. Right. And so, um, I don't think it's what do I what what do I wish we see in the small market that that's in the large market. We already have it. It's just a matter of 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 you know getting the name out there, getting the uh, getting it front of mind, getting advisors comfortable with the concept, that kind of thing. So that's kind of my two cents on that. Yeah, and and that's I've been a broken record about that one too. Uh, our small groups usually have a ten thousand dollar stop loss attachment point, which means basically the insurance companies are anti-selecting against bad risk because the first $10,000 of claims experience just drives your rates through the roof for a small group. And if you had a hundred life group, it might be 10,000 or maybe 25,000. If you had a thousand life group, it might be 25 or 50,000. It's like, there's so much better protection for the larger companies, not just the large numbers and spread of risk, but also the products available to it. So um, I agree wholeheartedly on that one. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned the uh, CGIB chip plan. You know, you just hit your first anniversary on this um, and had a nice press release, which I'll attach to in the show notes here. I think that was, uh, I guess not, was it a press release? Was it just an info bulletin? Whatever it was. Um, it, it looked good. Yeah. It was a communication. Yeah. yeah. Um, can you just um, talk maybe here, Jordan, a little bit? What has gone well with that plan? What are you proud of there? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I think what's gone really well is obviously just the performance of the pool. And it's a testament to the fact that, you know, what we said at the beginning about making sure that we're bringing on the right kind of risk, we're managing the risk appropriately throughout, um, that's evident with the numbers in the renewal. So I'm really, I'm really proud with how that's looking. Um, and honestly, you know, quoting volumes and sales volumes are starting to go up on this product because advisors are starting to see the benefits and they're starting to become a little more comfortable with, you know, positioning this type of a hybrid model with their prospects. So um, lots to be lots to be proud of there in that regard as well. I um, I think that um, I, I th it's a unique start to the product. Like, I mean, we took CGIB members that had sold the Ben account program and then rolled them into this fully pooled model. So a uh, kind of a different start than you would normally see. And, you know, it's a slow, small uh, group that's slowly growing. And as Jordan said, I mean, numbers for quoting and sales are up and I have people every day saying, Hey, I want to learn more about it. And, you know, how do I get my clients to have this, you know, controlled cost, uh, especially with inflation rates. And we'll maybe talk about a bit more about that along the way. But um, yeah, I, I think it's it's pretty cool uh, how it's it's held up for the first year, and it's still early. We've still got a long way to go, but it's it's neat to do it. And Jason, your question um, about you know was this a press release or not? One of the things that I wanted when we started this was transparency around the renewal process, and we have not had that in the insurance industry for the most part. Where stop loss numbers come from is just 
we don't know. We have to guess because the insurance companies, you know, pretty much refuse to give us that information. So um, my understanding now is stop loss on small group insured products has become one of the highest profit margin products. Um, and part of it is because of that lack of transparency. Um, so how do you argue a number um, that you don't know where it comes from or, or what's driving it? Actually, just a um, curiosity question yeah. here, Dave, if I can, I don't, I don't know the answer to this and I hope if you don't, I apologize for putting you on the spot. No, that's okay. Do you know with stop loss, is that mostly a reinsured risk or insurers actually taking the uh, stop loss? And maybe you know. It, yeah. I, okay. I, kind of, I kind of know, but do you, okay. do you want to take it, Dave? Maybe we sure. can enter together. Yeah. So um, bottom line is that um, the stop loss is a conceptual renewal philosophy. It is not an insured risk on small group insured plans. So when you get to big cases with ASO, and you are looking at, um, you know, whatever, like a thousand life case, and they buy $25,000 stop loss, it is a product that is defined, and it is an insurance product. But on the small group side of things, um, it's just a concept that they use for the renewal. So it's, it's not in the contract, it's not legally binding or anything, they can change it at any time, which makes it kind of interesting, right? So yeah. that's gotten a little bit tighter with CDIPSI, the Canadian um, drug insurance pooling corporation, I think it is. Nailed um, it. Sorry, Nailed Dan Birdie, if I, if I mess <laughs> that up. Um, but so once that happened, everybody was kind of on the same playing field and kind of administering more similarly, but, uh, it, it's still, it, it's still kind of an issue. So it's, it's not real. So t tomorrow, a $10,000 stop loss can become 12, five or 15, uh, because the insurance companies just want it to be. So that's, that's kind of a bit of a problem. Jordan, anything to add there? Yeah, uh, the, what I was going to add, I think, is the, is the common misconception that, and Dave and I have talked about this too, is people mix up what the industry pool means, oh, right? Yeah. And so just looking at, um, I was actually looking at a Sadipsy port recently, and the numbers are staggering as far as, you know, the trends on high cost drug claims. But what I've actually learned is that the insurer is the EP3 pool. And the yeah. EP3 pool through the insurer covers the first 10,000 up to 32,500 in, in high cost drugs. Anything over that 32.5 threshold goes into the Sedipsy industry pool. So there's a bit of a distinction there. And, you know, most folks tend to just kind of lump it all into one. Oh, it's the industry pool. It's the EP. It is different based on the threshold. So something to be cognizant of. Yeah, 100% right. So the insurance company, the employer is getting stuck with the first, let's say, ten thousand dollars of claims experience. Then the insurance company is getting stuck with the ten to thirty-two five, and then the industry pool, which is insurance companies all together, gets the last one. So you're one hundred percent right, and and the, that terminology has been mixed up a lot. A lot of people think EP three is the industry pool. It's not. It's the the pooling within the insurance company. Yeah. Just while I have you both uh, off script here. I yeah. I, can I just get a rundown? I think this would be useful for our listeners here on how CHIP approaches prescription drug coverage. I don't know, Jordan, if you want to feel that one. Sure. Yeah. So um, I guess just from like a formulary perspective or how it's covered or. Both. Um, so Both. You know, the small group, like where am I going to see pooling there? How much risk am I absorbing? What's what actually shows up in my renewal? Is that helpful, Jordan? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, so yeah, let's say, you know, a high cost drug claim hits your, your benefits plan. We're assuming Jason, you're the small employer here with the chip plan. Um, you know, you're, you're not going to get a specific renewal specific to your group. It's going to be for the pool. So you'll be able to see, uh, on this, like on the CGIB chip pool, like the renewal we just put out, you can see the total claims made and the total premium collected. And so it also, for the whole block, that's right, yep. yeah. And it also indicates, um, it, it also indicates the other, like it, it indicates um, claims removed due to pooling. So that all that information is in there. Um, so from a claiming perspective, that's kind of how that works. Um, yeah. Dave, so we have, we, I was gonna say, so we've got kind of a couple layers of protection and which is why it was kind of uh, maybe a bit easier to do this product than others. So normally you'd have the first 10,000 as the employer and then 10 to 32, like we talked about. Um, here we have a $1,000 deductible on the, um, on the health and 
specifically drugs. So the employees paying the first thousand dollars, usually out of their health spending account. And then the 1,000 to 10,000 is the BBD chip pool. And then once you go over 10,000, then you're reinsured to the green shield pool, which is behind BBD. So you've kind of got multiple levels of protection. Part the day-to-day -day low cost drugs is the employee ease perspective uh, problem or, or payment part, part. And then the next part goes to the insurance company and that's with the pool and then the next part goes to the industry so um, we really kind of protect ourselves and especially that one to ten thousand dollar mark where you have higher costs but not catastrophic costs um, that's where we're really kind of shining and taking off some of the bad risk on the top end and as i understand it sort of like because what you don't want to have happen here you get a 10 life group where five of them are going to be high cost drug claims you know that's yeah if if you have a bunch of advisors moving groups like that onto the chip pool, you're going to break the pool, right? So this is and, where education. And that's where so I important. become, yeah, that's where I become yeah. the bad guy in, in the right. whole thing. So, so BBD and, and, and Jordan can maybe tell about this. They do their medical underwriting like any new group. So they're asking for, are there high cost claims? What are total claims? If there's an existing group and if you can get the information, um, the goal is to provide insurance, not to provide coverage for the barn that's already burning, right? So um, if you, you know, walk in and you have five high cost claims out of 10, they're going to decline to quote because it's, it's, you know, you got to do a major plan design change or something to resolve that problem. Cause that, like you said, would kill the pool. Um, but that said, um, you know, claims are going to happen. So if you you've got a 10 life group and you hit a high cost claim, that's what the pooling is made to be for. Um, you know, when you get to two, three or four or five, I mean, there probably should be some thought to, you know, hold on, this isn't perfect, but it, it could happen. And we do see that sometimes with family businesses and hereditary diseases and, and things like that. Not very often, but 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 every now and then it, it does throw um, kind of a wrench in the whole thing. It is sort of a worst case scenario. Go ahead, Jordan. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, no, I was, I was just I was simply agreeing. Yeah. So um, that that is the risk you run. But again like what we're trying to do here with the chip plan is we're getting back to what insurance is really supposed to be doing right because all the time and i like i like to use the analogy of of car insurance right because it's one that everybody understands and everybody gets it you know it'd be nice if my car insurance covered things like oil changes and car washes <laughs> and new tires right the main the maintenance items things like that we would typically see in an insured plan like massage or Cairo or whatever, you know, do those items really need insurance, right? So again, we're trying to get back to what, what it is insurance is really supposed to be doing. And that's, that's why we, you know, do those assessments when we're looking at a new case, right? We're not, like Dave said, we're not going to take on the barn that's already burning, but we're going to offer protection in case that barn ever does burn, right? Then, then it's there. It's there to, to, to provide that financial protection. Cool. Let me, let me ask this kind of, as you see this going forward, um, I know I have some things that I'd like to see the product go to and yeah. changes in the plan and, and stuff over time. What do you think would be um, kind of good, good next steps in the evolution of this product and, and adjustments to the plan? Absolutely. Yeah. So I think, um, and, and we've talked about this, uh, like an exclusionary formulary would be, you know, something that I think would bode well for the pool. So um, something like a, like a formulary guard or a formulary protect plus that, um, you know, helps kind of reallocate the high cost drug claims off of the insured plan. Um, and so I think that that might be something that would be beneficial to the overall health of the pool as well. Um, so not, yeah. not anything that's happening within the next year, but something that I hope happens within the years to come and an enhancement that we add to the product. Yeah. And for those that are listening, depending where you are in Canada, everyone's kind of got a different position on this. So in Ontario, we do not have, um, the insurance companies don't adjudicate with our provincial health plan. So they kind of trump it and pay it and charge our clients rather than charging the province. In BC and Quebec, different story, you've got protection there. So less of an issue because the coordination is better. And uh, and we hope we'll get there one day. But for 20 years or so, the insurance companies have been doing it the way they've been doing it, which is really not quite right. So um, I think that exclusionary formulary is a way to protect the pool and also put some of those high cost drugs back to provincial plans and stuff where they belong. And we may see in November, a rare disease formulary or something in national pharmacare come out, which may take 
part of that on, but it's still too early to tell. Yeah. So that would um, be kind of like my initial, my initial, yeah. like where I'd, what I'd like to see, but what do you, what are you guys thinking? I, I'd love to see all small group pooled. So, I mean, yeah. take a, take a little bit of a turn from this and groups from two to 10 or maybe two to 20, 25, or even to 50. I'd love to see them fully pooled, one page renewal, no claims data, no negotiation, just make it simple. Let's let advisors provide value in the areas that they're skilled in, not in negotiations. That's not a skill set. That's just a, a commodity kind of driven thing to the lowest price. But there's a lot of areas that we can add real value if we're not messing around, taking all this time negotiating a you know, few points off a of renewal. Um, do you have any concerns, Jordan, around kind of the, the inflation rate and stuff like this? We're talking about making plan design adjustments, and we saw a 2% increase this year. So the chip pool has been really performing better than, than we could imagine. But as we kind of see inflation rising, do you see that as a, a risk to the pool? Uh, not, not really, honestly. Um, I think like we're in this we're in this for the long term. It's not a it's not a you know one two year thing and we're done. That's it with this. No, it's 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 here to stay. And there's going to be years of high higher inflation. That's just the nature of the beast. Um, but I don't know if it's right to say, but I really feel CGIB chip is almost inflation proof because you have that that element of the high uh, of the healthcare spending account that hybrid piece where the employer gets to call the shots on how much their benefit spend is going to be. So inflation is happening in real time as the plan member is making their claim, right? Yeah. Where if you were to put that under a traditional plan, like a $300, $500 per practitioner per year, you know, then, then the insurer is assuming, you know, the IBNR incurred but not reported. They're assuming the trend, the utilization, all these other factors where, you know, inflation does kind of become of a big deal. Um, but when you're looking at it, at it in the lens of a spending account, you know, they have their, you know, let's say it's a $2,000 annual max or 2,500. That's, that's the financial exposure to the, to the, to the plan sponsor. Like that's all they're going to be on the hook for. Um, so, you know, inflation is so almost like a, they a get to set the inflation rate if they yeah. want to increase the health spending account. So with underneath that limit, um, and I like the way you say financial exposure underneath that, you're going to see the cost going up every year, probably just in general from inflation, but the top end risk is capped by the employer. And then when they want to increase it down the road, they can increase it, whether that's every year, every few years or whatever, which really kind of leaves the employer more in the driver's seat, um, to some degree. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I think we've seen, although in, like inflation numbers are, are high, Healthcare inflation for a change is not as high as general inflation. Usually it's yeah. the other way around. And for people that kind of say, oh, well, the inflation rate, well, the inflation rate is a consumer price index of a basket of imaginary goods that are made up of everything from uh, gas to vehicle purchases, home heating to um, our case, healthcare and personal care is together. So shampoo and soap is in the same category as benefit plans, which, you know, so you kind of got to figure out how all that fits. But I mean, we've seen reasonable kind of numbers. I think we've seen drugs around 5.3 to 5.8%. Um, dental, you did a good article on um, dental fee adjustments and Ontario has had the highest this year at how much is it, Jordan? Four, uh, I think it's like 4.75 yeah, or something. Yeah, something, four and yeah. <laughs> four, and last year was four and a half. So, so yes, we have that. And there's, there's trends behind that as well that force it up higher. But, um, but I, I think that's, I, I think, like you said, it, you're not really getting rid of inflation, but you're kind of giving the employer a bit more control of it, if you will. Mm -hmm. So on that and slightly shifting a little bit, are you seeing anything similar in the market to this? That's, you know, a, a fully pulled, maybe transparent in, in its pooling and, and trying to keep that pricing reasonable from year to year? Yeah, absolutely. So there are there are a couple of uh, providers out there, Sirius being a big one in the pooled space, um, Chamber, you know, the Chamber of Commerce Group Insurance Plan being another big uh, player in the pooled space as well. Um, I'd say those are kind of the first two that really come to mind. Um, but as far as sharing like the pool financial results on a transparency basis to the advisor distribution channel, 
unless you unless both of you are privy to something that I don't know, I, I really I don't see anything else like that in the in the Canadian benefits landscape. So yeah. um, that's what makes this a little a little bit more special. And interesting you say Canadian benefits landscape because there are some in the US where they do show the pool, like it's, it's a requirement by law that they show here's what was collected, here's what was paid, here's our administration fees and charges and profit margin and, and stuff. There are there are products down there in the south of the border that are Ooh. that way. So um, it's so a it's, bit more transparent in some and some oh, states okay. and oh, not okay. everywhere. Yeah. So um, it's a legal obligation though. Like that's, that's pretty it is. interesting. Yeah, you, you got to force them to do it. That was kind of part of Obamacare. I mean, and I'm oversimplifying the yeah, U.S. No, market like yeah. crazy. But um, <laughs> let me ask this. Do you worry about more people doing this and creating uh, products that are open to the market? Because um, you have to be, as um, Jason or you mentioned, you have to be a CGIB member to sell the CHIP program. And that's part of that, um, ensuring that we keep a clean group of of uh, good benefit educated advisors that do field underwriting and so on. Um, but just do you see a product being fully open to everybody that's fully pooled and transparent down the road? And is that a risk or, or what, how do you take that? I think that's an opportunity. I wouldn't really see that as a risk. And the reason I see it as an opportunity is because, um, you know, I think, I think if we're going to be fully pooling, if that's the way forward, if that's what a lot of, you know, the providers are going to gravitate towards, that's only going to put small businesses in a better financial position when it comes to renewal. Right. So um, am I worried? No, not really. I think, I think everybody should be, um, you know, working to serve the client better and in a way that makes good financial and financial sense. Um, Keep up that innovation. Keep up the innovation. Yeah. Don't stop. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah, I do think this is a rising tide floats all boats type of scenario here that, uh, you know, with only sort of like, you you know, maybe you serious chambers doing this, but as you get more people who have, let's say, better products for that small business market, that small group market, I think yeah, you're, you're going to see innovation. There's There's got to be stuff there. I know you two are very bright, but there's going to be stuff there that, you know, that you haven't considered, right? So, oh, yeah. yeah. I think the, the big the big piece though moving forward is that there has to be some kind of an ed, like some kind of education coming from you know who the provider is providing the product about you know how to properly sell it how to properly manage the pool how to you know they have to have that education piece there or else it could it could tank very quickly um, so you know advisors that begin to sell these types of products they really know they really need to know how to do the field underwriting and assess the risk up front to you know ensure long-term viability sustainability all that good stuff yeah funny enough I actually had an uh, email exchange with Megan Vallis who's at um, uh, at equitable and um, she's been um, doing and, and uh, doing a, kind of a bit of uh, speaking about stops uh, spreadsheeting and start recommending, like starting to add value. It's not just about lowest prices, you know, like, and you've kind of got to get out there and that's, that's an insurer or, or a representative of an insurance company that's getting out there, educating and helping people to understand. I mean, like, like you've been doing with the, the chip program and other, other products as well. So kind of neat. Previous podcast guest, Megan Vallis, actually. Oh, was she? Yeah. yeah. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, she was, yeah. yeah. Awesome I missed guest, that yeah. one. I'll have to go listen to the old ones I've missed. I'll, I'll put it in the show notes. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, I know, Jordan, uh, that this is your first time actually designing something from scratch here, but I'm interested in your learnings from being involved in the development of this product. So. Yeah. What did you learn about the underwriting process or underwriting in general from from going through this? Absolutely. So um, I think, honestly, what I really learned at the end of the day is is how to be a better field underwriter. Like, what kind of questions do we need to be asking to assess risk up front? It wasn't really something that I had thought much about before this product. Um, but, you know, kind of putting more of a lens on making sure that the pool is going to be sustainable. It's going to renew well. You re- like, I really had to kind of dig in and think about these kinds of things, right? So um, I, I feel like that, that was kind of the big piece that I learned along the way as far as like from an underwriting perspective. You, you know, what's interesting about that was um, as we were kind of preparing to do this and I was talking a little bit about field underwriting, 
with different advisors and Jordan and Mel and Taryn and like a bunch of people at BBD is there hasn't been a group insurance field underwriting manual written in over 20 years. The last one I could find was 2000 uh, by Manulife and I haven't seen one since. And that was when we, when I started the business 25 years ago, the first thing you got from an insurance company was their field underwriting manual. And it would have, these are the industries we don't do. These are the industries that are high risk that, that we you know can't accommodate because maybe you're more blue collar, white collar, pink collar, gray collar, whatever. And so that would help you understand kind of where that insurance company or TPA fit. And nobody really does that anymore. So um, I think like Jordan said, kind of asking those questions, doing that field underwriting of why are you putting in a plan today? Do you have high cost drugs? What's your biggest concern? Who are you trying to protect? What are you trying to offer? Kind of all that information uh, really helps to un- identify the problems, which then lead you to a solution. And I, yeah. and I think that's, again, where the advisor adds a whole lot to it. Um, so Jordan, just how much, how important is it communicating, especially this product, I guess, to the plan member, what's different about it or, you know, how does, how is making sure they understand it matter versus traditional plans or traditional products? Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, I think, Obviously, the plan member education for any plan is important, but specifically for CGIB chip, it, it really should be top top of mind for the advisor to make sure they're communicating this plan properly, um, mostly because of the, the deductible, right? And deductibles have always been there in group plans. Like, it's nothing new, but this is a high deductible. Like, it's a very high deductible plan. So, you know, one of the biggest kind of one of the biggest things that's going to come up most often is the plan member at the pharmacy going to make their prescription for, you know, it's a $50 drug claim, let's say that they're, that they're claiming at the pharmacy. And if they don't know that there's a high deductible there or that they can auto coordinate with their HCSA, they're going to get that decline and they're going to be pretty upset. No one, you know, if, if people haven't explained it to them properly or they haven't explained the process of how it works, and just um, explain that. So you would get yeah. a decline because let's assume it's January one, you have a thousand dollar deductible, the fifty dollars is going towards a thousand. So it's it's a decline, but then it auto adjudicates if you have turned it on um, to the health spending account and you're reimbursed at a hundred percent up to your health spending account limit. So being prepared for that is huge. And you've put together some documents to help with that. I have, yeah. So um We've been, it's all on the CGIB chip landing page on the member zone, but uh, we put together um, like a catastrophic health rollout plan. So it goes over all of those nuances, right? Like what's the deductible? What does the plan design look like? What's covered through the insured component, right? What's not covered through the insured component, but could be put through the healthcare spending account. So all of those resources are, are made available to advisors promoting this plan, just because we want to make sure that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's simple for them to sell and communicate to the plan member and plan sponsor respectively. Right. So um, I think if we can do that and we're providing the right resources, then all the power to them. Right. Yeah. And, and I think that it's, it is important like that whole education thing. And, you know, people see the coordination of benefits as being complicated. Um, it's not really, I mean, first of all, two thirds of the audience, it's not an issue. Whether if you're single with no spouse, coordination doesn't matter. So it's all auto adjudicate. If you're a family and have no spousal coverage, same thing. What we're really talking about is the people that have spouses with family coverage where they can coordinate. And so people kind of get mixed up in the, you know, just using traditional things. His plan pays for his, her plan pays for hers. Then they go back and forth and the last pair is health spending account. And you just have to, you know, wrap your head around a little bit there. And your communications made that you know pretty clear for most people. Um, once they've done a claim or two, they, they get the flow of it. So I think that's really important. Good. Yep. And there's nothing wrong with the a good employee education session either. So <laughs> that's, that's it. Um, yeah. Now, what about just, you know, Dave talked before a little bit about sort of interprovincial complexities here, um, given that you're uh, running a product across provinces. You know, I always think about taxes here, provincial premium tax or GST, HST, PST on administrative fees. How'd you crack that in that, Jordan? 
I don't know if I can answer that one, Dave. Do you have any okay. insight on that, or might have to take that one yeah. back to our underwriters? <laughs> yeah, we, the plan we tried to simplify it the same across the country, so the plan yeah. design is the same everywhere. There's two sets of rates um, for pharmacare and non-pharmacare, so that yeah. instantly kind of uh, helps to balance things out. And then whatever province you're in, you're still charged all the regular tax taxes and stuff. So if you're a, an Alberta um, employer with Ontario employees, then they're going to have Ontario retail sales tax applied to them. The Alberta ones, no. So it, it follows just like everybody else. There isn't, um, we haven't gotten rid of HST or PST or <laughs> RST or, or whatever. So yeah, I wish it was that simple. <laughs> um, what a nightmare. I, I find this is like one of, it's one of those little issues, but it really can creep up and and be a big problem so yeah and it's always evolving i mean we had i was a saskatchewan i think that um was talking about bringing in a premium tax or making benefits taxable at one point or like it's it, it kind of comes up raises its head every now and then yeah they were going to charge um provincial sales tax on your overall premium that was the uh Ooh. that was the yeah. very temporarily in saskatchewan that was the case and then it was like six months of that they rescinded it so yeah yeah. And I mean, that's, we're in a constant state of change. I mean, we saw years ago, uh, New Brunswick was trying to put in a provincial pharmacare model, similar kind of to Quebec or BC, I guess a little bit. Um, Medivy Blue Cross was going to run it in the background and the employers were going to get billed for the whole thing. And uh, that seemed like a good idea um, until the employers being billed for the whole thing was launched. And then the employers basically said, thanks, we'll find another province to go to um, and move our business. And very quickly, the government was toppled pretty much over that um, plan. So it never came to fruition. So, you know, there's, there's going to be pushing and, and changing and evolving, I think, all the way through this. Um, any other learnings that you want to share, Jordan, that you kind of came up with through all this, um, CGIB, the CHIP plan and so on? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the one big, the one big thing, and I kind of learned this from one of our co uh, colleagues at Green Shield, is it's called the drip factor. And maybe you're familiar with, with this so-called drip factor, but, you know, um, the only way people are going to catch on to something or they're going to remember something is by always dripping whatever it is you want them to, to learn, right? So um, I find that, you know, we've done a lot of CGIB chip sessions, either through coffee chat or through webinars or what have you. And it's a good forum for advisors to come on and just reacquaint themselves with the plan, refamiliarize themselves with, you know, how does this plan work? What does it do? Who does it serve? That kind of thing. And just hear from other advisors as well. Um, and I think the more we're able to kind of do that, the more we're able to drip the plan, you know, keep it top of mind with advisors. That's what really leads to the high quote volumes, sales volumes, because it's top of mind. Advisors, they they get it, they understand it slowly but surely. They they start to understand it, right? So um, definitely, definitely the drip factor is a big one. Um, I think just having open open communication is huge too, right? Like um, again, the one thing that's really setting this product apart is the transparency, so advisors can see exactly what's going on in the pool premiums versus claims. Um, and I think, I think transparency is huge, not just for the advisor, but for the end, the end, you know, plan sponsor as well. They want to see what their benefit plan is doing for them. Right. So um, yeah, I would say those are kind of the, kind of the big takeaways from all of this and just good partnerships, you know, working, working with uh, people that want to serve the, serve the customer better and offer better solutions to the, to the small business owner. So Fantastic. Um, so anything else you'd like to share with the uh, listeners before we wrap up here? Jordan, you've been great. You've shared a ton of great, uh, I think, insight and really just a good story about getting a product out to market that I think does solve the problem. But anything else you want to share? Yeah. So um, I look forward to whatever is whatever is coming up next. And uh, I think, you know, I said I said it in the beginning, like right from the start with with the CGIB chip plan. I always use the catchphrase, you know, shifting shifting the narrative on employee benefit plans now and for the future. Um, and I, I really I really feel that that holds true because again, like I said, we're getting back to what insurance is actually supposed to be doing here. So um, 
that's a narrative I'm just going to, I'm going to keep on using that. So that's the, that's the big takeaway. If, if you get anything from this. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I would like to kind of maybe add one more thing. Uh, the chip renewal being the first one done. And for people that aren't kind of familiar with the product, there's information on the public CGIB page as well. Um, the fact that we had a 2% increase kind of showed proof of concept. So it's, it, it didn't blow up right away. It's, it's running well. So I think a lot of advisors that were kind of hesitant and kind of watching from a distance are now kind of going, oh, maybe this is okay. Maybe this is proving itself. Maybe this is doing um, better than average. Uh, like my average block of business, um, average increase is about three and a half percent over the past 15 years. Um, trending up a little bit higher this year, but but overall kind of hanging three and a half, four percent. So I, I think more people now are kind of going, okay, you've you've got a year under the belt. Now let's maybe take a look at getting a quote. So I think that's a pretty positive evolving part of this process as well. Totally. And anybody listening that wants to learn more about this product, we actually have a webinar uh, series or session rather coming up on September, Tuesday, September 13th at 1 p.m. Eastern. So if you reach care to learn to your, more. Reach yeah. out to your BBD rep and um, they can give you more details on the whole thing. And I'd like to just say, just kind of maybe as we get close to closing here, um, I really appreciate BBD kind of taking the chance to do this. Um, a lot of, I mean, for 20 years, I've been saying we need pooled small group product and nobody has offered to kind of pick up that slack. And um, whether it's, you know, Mike McClanahan listening to me vent about this for probably close to 20 years or yourself, and we had, you know, Danny a little bit at the beginning, and Mel and Taryn's been involved, and a whole bunch of other people. It's a big team effort to make this mm -hmm. whole thing happen. It's not just me, it's not just Jordan, there's a whole bunch of other people. Yeah. And, you know, we, we hope it kind of keeps going in the right direction, and hope more people see it of, as value, for sure. I want to throw in there that I was pleasantly surprised, and it, this is going to sound like maybe a, a backhanded comment or whatever, but <laughs> pleasantly surprised that this survived the acquisition of BBD by People Corp, right? This is, I have that right, that, you know, you, so often when you see an acquisition like that, like big publicly traded company comes in, buys somebody up, and they sort of wipe a clean slate. And I have not, like, I've not seen any evidence of that with BBD for sure. That's, uh, I feel like, Jordan, you're uh, still operating at pretty much the same, like, same tenor you've been operating at previously. So I... Ooh. I really do like that. Like that, that gave me a lot of confidence that the product is, you know, you talked about it, Jordan, is somewhat future ready or future proof. So, yeah, absolutely. And, and just interestingly, yeah. I mean, it was, it went from BBD, privately held company, to Group Quest and um, BBD and all these companies being picked up through People Corp, which became public, which then turned back to private again with the purchase by Goldman Sachs. So, you know, yeah. it, there's been a lot of changes going on, you know, uh, over the past few years. And uh, it's been great that this um, this product has survived and thrived. So good on you, Jordan, yeah. for making that happen. Of course. Happy, happy to do so. Again, it just comes back to, you know, is what we're is what we're doing serving the cost, like is it serving the, the plan sponsor in a positive way? And I think as long as we kind of adhere to that kind of philosophy, then then we're good to go. You know what I mean? So um yeah th those are my final thoughts <laughs> <laughs> there we go dave can we give you the last word then um i, I think i just said it like i i mean I'm, I'm really happy i see lots of opportunity ahead i still think this is the best business in the world um we see good and bad all the time whether it's crazy inflation numbers crazy renewal philosophies insurance companies coming in and buying business and and then turning around and you know big increases rate guarantees rate caps we see a lot of volatility in this marketplace and stuff, but I still think it's a great business. Where else do you get to help so many people, um, both our clients and their, their employees. And uh, so I, I think anything that's new, that's maybe a little bit of innovative and gives opportunity um, for the employers to serve them, I think is, is a big win. So, um, and, and Jason, thank you for helping make this all possible because I'm hoping that we can do kind of a lot of these focusing on all sorts of different parts of the benefits world. And uh, like I said, there isn't a lot out there. So thank you for making this happen. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Jordan, for being our inaugural guest. That's exciting. So.
That was, uh, again, I really enjoyed that. You can see um, Jordan and Dave have a nice rapport. I think Dave and I are starting to get there. Um, so that's excellent. Uh, the number for today's episode is five. The number for today's episode is five. Uh, I hope that uh, you'll join me again in two weeks' time. In uh, two weeks, it depends on, I guess, how we look at this. Uh, my next interviews will be um, one with a former Calgary City police officer talking about the sort of hands-on, on-the-ground impacts of um, money laundering and financial crimes at that sort of more grassroots level. And then we'll have our next interview that Dave and I'll do will be with a, a pharmacist, a sort of rural Alberta pharmacist. I'm quite looking forward to both of those. These are both topics that are a little bit outside of my comfort zone. I hope you'll join us again and enjoy your continued studies. Thank you very much.